Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 241, dos, cuatro, uno, dos, cuatro, uno. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. How am I? Hmm, could be better. As you guys can see from the video, if you're not watching the video, what are you doing now via audio podcast? Get over to the YouTube channel, subscribe and like my videos. But if you're seeing, watching through the video, you can see... I have a nasty little, look at that spot right there, camera, can you pick that up, eh, webcam, can you pick that up, got a spot there, I don't know why, it might be, might have something to do with the copious amounts of eggs that I'm eating in the morning, right, frying them, scrambling them, whatever I'm doing, I'm always eating fucking eggs, I'm always on the keto or something, I have streaky bacon, sausages, bits of chicken, avocado, loads of good healthy fats, but sometimes your skin goes... Your skin starts to scream, so I think that might be part of the reason why. Um, so please excuse me. I know that's a bit nasty to be eating something. Maybe skip this bit, but yeah, I think I might have to switch it up and go and buy some oats, some cereals, some mixed nuts, and all that sort of malarkey, and just to kind of mix up my diet somewhat. Because right now, right now, the copious amounts of eggs are not working for my skin, and I've already got my skin's quite oily or greasy, or you know, I sweat quite a lot. So the last thing I need is another. Um, uh, is it's some more liquids or some more like you know greasy liquids entering my body and somehow you know they've only got one place to go in it <laughs> out of your skin okay i'll stop with the nastiness i'm sorry that sounds disgusting but anyway i'm back back again <laughs> thanks so much for tuning in as per usual if you're listening via the podcast app you know how it is loads of links will be in the show description if you're watching via the youtube app please check below in the description you'll find links to all the stories i talk about i'm actually going to maybe change up and put those in the top comments of the video so maybe people can make sure they see it because no one really clicks and read more thing but apart from that i hope you guys are doing well hope you guys are doing great i'm doing awesome thank you for asking so turbo still going well only a few days left I was thinking of going to an event in Fold this weekend. Uh, Fold are having a part. What is it again? Um, there's a party at Fold happening, right? I forgot what the event is. Let me see if I can find it. I think this has turned into the official, the unofficial or the official uh, Fold nightclub um, promotion page, isn't it? But, you know, what can you do? So there's this um, smoke machine party happening at Fold that's happening. Got 10, years, 10 years of smoke machine, Boris Blind Observatory, uh, Disco Connect and Quaker, I think I've got the, can I put that up on the screen now? I hope you guys should see that now, right now, yeah, yeah so, so, um, on the 25th of October, from 11, from 10 o'clock, actually, from 6, so, a little bit earlier than the usual events they have on there, um, it's, uh, tickets are still available now, 13.50, you know, like I said before, Fold, one of the best clubs out in London at the moment, loads of good times to be had there, I was thinking of going to Fold, but you know what, I feel I might sack it off and actually just stay in and just make some mixes, record podcasts, read and do the good, um, Serb October stuff and dip, just i think sober october is like not only sober october from drugs and alcohol but also sober october from the stuff that you generally do day to day right you, the things that you do when you're in your standard debauchery um day-to-day -day lifestyle um so avoiding those places avoiding bars and pubs and nightclubs and anything that's got a smoke machine and just kind of pushing it to one side and saying no i must resist i must keep myself clean and sober until the 31st of october when it just passes after midnight and it hits the 1st of November and now I'm going to go white girl crazy, turn into Miley Cyrus on her 18th birthday and just do everything. <laughs> That's the plan, which is unfortunate really, isn't it? It goes from sober October to bend in November. I saw someone putting in there um, in a YouTube comment earlier on and that was really an accurate description of it. But I feel I was thinking of going to this, but I'm probably not. So if you are going to go um, have fun, let me know how, what you think of it. Smoke Machine at Fold, 10 years of Smoke Machine, go and celebrate with those big dogs there. It should be awesome. For me, for myself, I might actually do a live stream. That might be quite cool. Just do a little live stream at home and just chill and relax, watch some things online, drink some herbal tea and just, you know, Live life, man, you know? Live life, man. Get out there, you know what I mean? Apart from that, what's been going on? Nothing much, in it, really? Indivision parties coming up. Well, not really. It's December, so it's not really coming up soon. Not really have anything else on the calendar that I'm actually going to, that I'm excited about, really, is there? Let me check my RA, um, res my RA calendar, see if anything I was really stoked on. Not that much, really. Um, So we've got, the, we've got some Halloween parties happening next Thursday. Um... On the first day, exactly. Then we got some things happening on Friday. We got made. Oh, there's a major in calls now happening on Friday. A nocturnal sunshine, um, which would be pretty cool. That's her like pseudonym. So maybe check that out. There's good talk at Printworks, which has got quite a good lineup. I know some people might think it's a bit naff to go to a Peggy Goo night, but you know, I think if you're about the electronic music life, you won't really give a shit. 
Um, obviously, oh no, I'm not going to that because I'm DJing on the Friday, on the Saturday, sorry, the second of November. That's about it, really. I don't really have anything else I've, I've got in my mind that I really wanted to go to. Um, I can't really think of anything, to be honest. I can't think of something. No, I can't really, can't really think of anything. So let's see what these events are saying. So we've got here, we've got Good Talk. All oh, the tickets are completely gone for that. Completely sold out. Good Talk at Printworks, which is a really good lineup, to be fair. Um, there's over a thousand, one thousand two hundred thirty-six people um, clicked attending on RA again. No, that's no um. That's no uh, indication of how many people are going to turn up. But the fact that all the tickets are sold out is a good indication of it because usually places that print works don't fuck around with the ticket allocations. They usually ain't going to be any available at the door. If it reaches capacity, you won't be able to get in anyway, even with a ticket. So, you know, they usually do a good job of keeping that um, legit. So in the press halls, you've got Peggy Goo headlining, of course. You've got Octave One Live. You've got DJ High, who's fucking awesome if you've ever been to... Um, oh, what do you fucking call it? What's the place in... Um, what's the place in Dawson that she used to DJ at? Damn it, with the watermelon sign of it. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. There's a pub in Dawson Lane that DJ High kind of got her start from and where Boost, we kind of got to see her a lot every weekend and she kind of blew up from there. Um, so she's really good. Rami, I'm not familiar with DMX Crew, obviously I'm familiar with Derek May's going to be DJs. That should be fucking awesome to see him live playing and being fucking aggressive on the decks. Dark Crimson, they got iCube. they got Susan Craft, which should be fucking sick. Some of the really good production from him. Uh, De Niro, DJ Richard and Hiver. So yeah, really good lineup on that one. That is on the 2nd of November. And then on the 1st of the, the Friday, the 1st, which is probably something I'll go to because I'm DJing on the 2nd, so I can't do that. But on the 1st of November, the Friday, May Jane Cole presents Nocturnal Sunshine. Um, that's basically her pseudonym that she uses. So she'll be playing alongside her own pseudonym, which is funny. Benji B, Josie Mitsu, and Wax Wings. That's going to be at Fold from 11 to 6. So yeah, the two great nights happening in conjunction. And then, of course, last but not least, my party, Labatees with DJ Hanson Black. As you can see, the attending list is not as big at the other events but you know i'm starting you know like, i'm at the lower level you know I'm, I'm earning my stripes um that's myself handsome black man playing at the heath cotton star in leighton stone on the 2nd of november from nine to one check me out check me in my friend if you're in london and you want to see me play the good old new disco house funk soul r&b and all that malarkey so let's get into some topics so much stuff to talk about want to go run through we don't have that much time as per usual you know it's always the rush between this time when you come back from the gym and you want to go to work so want to get straight into the topics and then we can go about our merry way is that a deal cool safe let's get into this so as i go into my notes i'm like, i saw my hair go go get a haircut in it as well man my hair grows so quickly guys it's so annoying i just got a haircut a couple of weeks you know a week ago or something like that skin fade and it's look 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 how far look how quickly it's grown look man annoying Anyway, let's do this. So, uh, da, 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 number one topic to talk about. What do we want to talk about here? Number one. Let's go for this. Best parties for a DJ. This is a, a, an article from Mix Mag uh, in their secret DJ um, uh, column, which is a really good one. I think, actually, there's some really good articles that I've kind of pointed out previously that I've read on here and some others that I've seen. I think there's actually a book as well out at the moment that you can check out, but always some very insightful um, topics kind of expounded upon regarding the secret DJ and he or she's uh, climb up or experience within the scene. So this, this, this is titled The Secret DJ. The best parties are when the crowd and DJ are unified and it's on Mix Mag now and it's the subtitle is as new track request technology raises questions about the very purpose of DJing, our mystery spinner grapples with extensionism, right? So a new app called Pissily is uh, being developed that allows club goers to vote on which song the DJ should play next during their set. Like what? Fuck off. Users can search and select song from their music libraries for their suggestions and whichever track receives the majority of the vote from the crowd gets clued up. That is insane, really. That's like suggest. That's like going to a comedy club and telling the person on the stage what joke they should tell or what what kind of subjects they should talk about. The brutal truth is, the brutal reality is, as um um Jerry Seinfeld said, like what he does is very special. Not everyone can do it, right? There's a, it's a particular skill. That kind of you know cocky arrogance, that kind of um, self assuredness. That I've 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 uh, dedicated my life to Jerry Seinfeld would say he's dedicated his life to constructing jokes right to sitting down and chopping and changing and trimming a sentence until it's perfect right until the joke lands exactly where it should do in all these different places he's going to try it out all over the country all over the world so for this Joe Schmo who hasn't thought about a joke more than 20 minutes in his life right to him, he should suggest to this professional what he should talk about next is quite disrespectful. And in general, the public doesn't want to do that anyway. 
I don't want to go to an event and have to work for something. I want you as an artist or as a creative to present something to me so that I can either enjoy or not enjoy. But I don't have to work for it. I don't want to have to. It's like when you go to. Have you ever been to those restaurants um, where they make you put away your own stuff? Have you been to those kind of things? How annoying is that? Like, it's like in the service industry, you go to a restaurant, you order something to eat and they put the plate on the counter. You pay with your money. You have to pick up the plate yourself, get your own forks and sit down. Where are we? Are we in the fucking school? Are, are we back in primary school or something? Like, give me my, bring my food to me, man. It's a service industry, isn't it? Like, this is, it, it, it baffles, it boggles belief that, 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 that's a thing. Now, if you come back and tell me, oh, the reason why they do that is so they can pay the, the waitresses or the, not waitresses, but the people that work in the kitchen or that work behind the till more money, cool. But I bet you any money, the people that own these places, the, the scumbags, don't even pay them a good wage. Because if you're going to offset that and give them a basic salary, because most service industry dogs just have a shit salary, shit base level, and then you get more tips, right? That's the kind of thinking, the kind of hoodwink they get you in. Cool. But if you're going to give them a base salary, so then you that requires us to pick up our plate, fair enough. But most of the times, I bet you, they still get shit, they still get shit pay, and we have to then go and put away our fucking place that we're nine years old. Annoying, right? So I don't get... So apps like this, I don't understand why you'd want it. Like, why would you want to request a song? Like, what makes you think that you have more musical knowledge than Gerdy Anson? Like, how arrogant would that be for you to be as, 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 a, as, as a punter? And also, when you go and see Gerdy Anson play, or when you've seen her boiler room set from him, what's made you interested to go see Gerdy Anson? Oh my God, wow. How did he know how to select that tune? That tune, selection, that tune selection was awesome. Wow, he's a really good DJ. So what you go do, you go on RA, you search Gerdy Anson, you see, see, his, you see his listings, you go to where, he, um, you click um, attending or RSVP and the listing near you, and you go and watch him play because he impressed you via a boiler room video. Not because he suggested that you should go and suggest a fucking song to him. It's insane, man. Who would want that? Like, come on. So what the amount of the amount of trolls you're going to see at these fucking shows with this kind of technology. Everyone's just going to be requesting fucking Baby Shark and I don't know, an old time road, right? Like, what else are people going to do? Like, Fresh Prince of Bel Air soundtrack. Like, it's going to be an absolute shit show. Don't do this. Anyway. Uh, this is a this is a little late to the party. I first heard about automated DJing in the late nineties. Uh, some German scientist had an array of sensors in the club that could read temperature, crowd noise, and even register when hands went in the air. A computer read these responses and would choose the next record accordingly and mix it in. Allegedly, it did it didn't do a good bad job, which is a de, which is debatable as it could only do trance. <laughs> Funny. There's also, of course, a slew of tech that automates DJing process. Unbelievably, it is now the norm not to be able to mix without help even spotify mixes for you now but this is fresh tech is skewed more towards the crowd potentially making a dj finally and internally obsolete turning everything you hold dear into nothing more than a very large and very expensive jukebox now i've long suggested that because of again I've, i'm i'm on a come up right i'm a dj that's only playing in bars and pubs you know for a hundred quid or so you know I, i'm just at the basic amateur level but i have said i have also thought to myself sometimes when i played in shops for store events and stuff for a bit more money or i've played at other bigger venues especially in the beginning or something i've always kind of thought to myself like why are they why do they even hire a dj for a place like this one they could probably have done better getting paying like a really high profile dj to curate a playlist or to cure or to put together a soundtrack a score um an in a sound installation of some sort that would have probably done a lot better. That would have probably been more used than having this weird, awkward DJ dude or girl standing in the corner of a store or standing in the front of a store trying to DJ. Because it always looks awkward and weird. I know they pay a lot. There's corporate gigs. I've done them myself. No shade to anyone that do it, does them. But they're fucking awkward, right? There's no one wins in that regard. You look like a numpty standing there, like trying to look like you're enjoying yourself. The people walking past you feel awkward because they're not standing and dancing because they're just in a shop right there's not the same you're not in the right mindset to come and you know have a good dance you just want to i don't know catch up with your industry friends or your scene friends or buy something and keep it moving right so it's just a weird environment but to the brand they associate dj underground culture right alternative scene with kind of this edge with kind of um with their brand right so they're trying to they're trying to position their brand to be edgy or to be forward thinking DJs don't do that, right? You can't necessarily fake the funk with that sort of stuff, right? If you're going to fake the funk, if you're going to do it legitimately, like, I don't know, close the shutters, turn that shit pitch black, get rid of all the clothes and start really doing the shit. You know what I mean? When I've been doing the shit, you know what I'm talking about. Start getting down, down, right? But no one's going to do that. Everyone's trying to pretend and make stuff Instagram worthy and picture worthy for hype these Nobody cool, do your thing. But no one really wins that way. So I always wondered that like, why don't some places just have jukeboxes? And I always think about 
some bars and pubs that play out where there's not really a need to have a DJ. You're disturbing their night. Then you're disturbing their night. Um, you're you're not really having a good time yourself, right? It's just no one wins in this regard. And I think sometimes it might be better off for the for the bar manager to just go out and seek somebody like me, one that's kind of DJ, to put together a playlist. And it's fresh every week. Just send them a fresh playlist of songs that you think would work in a bar, and then have them just play that like on loop in the store. I think that would work pretty well. I would, I would, I think that would work better than because some pubs you go to, um, what's that one is in, in Lower Clapton near, near Clapton Pond? I went there one time at eight p.m. and there was this guy playing like I don't know fucking techno at that time, like super loud, like no, could not consider it at all about the people that are in there and the time because some that's the that's the honest truth as well. Most DJs are just, most DJs on that kind of lower level, on the level that I'm on, aren't very good, right? And it's a fact of life. It's like most open micers. And they're not very aware of how to play for that kind of crowd, right? You're just trying to play your own sound and be an artist. But you're probably more of a, you're probably more of service to the people that you are playing in front of than the bigger DJs, right? If you're Dixon or those kind of guys, you don't, you don't care about what we want. You just play what you want and we're going we're gonna to have to like it. But when you're playing at a bar, or a pub somewhere you just need to be a little bit more understanding of the environment you're in that's why i never put the sound super loud at the beginning i always start very slow i want to be considered the space i'm in right and kind of give them and kind of give the people everyone a chance to kind of you know see whether or not they like what i'm going to play because the last thing i want is to go into a place put it all to max press play and have people just walk out because they don't like it i want to give them a, a chance to like it or not like it and usually for, i've noticed i have people hanging around for about an hour or so and after that they'll be like you know what He's going to start DJing, DJing. I'm going to go home, which is fair. You gave me an hour of your time. I don't deserve any minutes of your time. So to get that is more than happy to. But I think some bars and pubs could be better off just having a playlist. Honestly, just have a, or have a jukebox. I know it's not really a UK thing. It's more of an American thing. But having something like that would work really well. And maybe, you never know, some, someone like Spotify down the road might be get into like designing hardware and designing things that they can put into i don't know um, stores or shops where people can select the tune and stuff. That might be cool. But I don't know, man. Like, why have a DJ in a bar and pub sometimes? This makes no sense, really, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Um, now to continues. In essence, we are approaching the singularity at the murky heart of the whole thing, i.e., what is a DJ for? After all, it's not the purpose of modern capitalism to be disruptive or to be more blunt to destroy the re and replace. So if the tunes are chosen by an algorithm, or at best because they resemble each other greatly, then there are app mixes, then an app mixes them. Is a DJ just there to look good or display some sort of gimmick or contribute to a work or edgy image, like I mentioned previously? Is the next step all about removing the DJ entirely from the equation? After all, we are arguably the at point at almost at that point but personally i wouldn't mind a long holiday <laughs> this does of course hinge entirely on the question of whether requests or even the opinions of dance floor are important i would argue they are they are well not they're not of course naturally i don't think anyone's tasting music but mine matters unfortunately these days uh that's what make everyone thinks on the other hand at the act of listening to a request doesn't does have value you are a professional and it is as such your job to listen. Nod and smile. Then utterly ignore the track they ask for, of course, right? <laughs> Unless it is a good one and you are actually about to play it, which simply never happens. Of course, I, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've actually been I've actually been given a request that made sense. Not a good I'm not saying good or bad, because that's subjective, even though there is bad music and there's good music, we all know that. But let's just be kind and say subjective what good or bad music is. I don't think I've ever in my life ever had more than five people or more than had more than five occasions had somebody come up and request a song that was that made sense and when i mean made sense i mean you're playing a jazz set and then suddenly someone says oh play this other jazz tune never happens it's always like you're playing jazz play rihanna you're playing rihanna play bob dylan there's no correlation co no correlation right to any of the genres or any of the songs that have been requested as a part apart from that person wanting to hear that track at that time it's fucking baffling it's honestly one of the most baffling things I've done, I've seen in my entire life. I never get it. Number one, the cheek of you to come up to a DJ and ask them for a request is just insane. I've don't, I don't think I've ever asked a request in my entire life. My, my whole experience of going to up to DJs to say you're doing a great job or to ask them for the tune ID, right? That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. I've never said play this or play that. If I don't like what they're playing, you leave the dance floor. You come back later. I don't know. You just dance. You go home. Whatever it is. But you don't go up to them and tell them what they should and shouldn't play. It doesn't make any sort of sense. It's, just, it's, 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 it's insane. Like, I don't get it. It's like going to watch a cinema and going to watch a movie and then suddenly asking the people at the front, oh, can you change to something else? No, you go to another room and buy another ticket, you donkey. Like, it's just, ugh, the utter kind of, I don't know. Um, 
Anyway, it continues. Um, but more important, but the more important, que- the more interesting question is whether DJs are more vital to a night out than the people who who have paid for a DJ to be there. Then we have to wonder: Are people now merely paying to see a minor celebrity pretend to perform, or are they there to listen to a dance and music authentic set of skill? Which is interesting. I'm not too sure if that what that is, but I do think DJs probably hold more weight than the actual club most of the time, especially in London. Uh, most that's the reason why they they were always fucking booking big ticket and people that's why i have a lot of respect for xoyo for doing the whole pleasure hood thing right uh, making sure that you know they turn in their fitness it's saturdays or fridays one of them they're turning them into just like you know um essentially resident nights right um getting their their uh, friends and family to bring in their friends to come and play but no headliners no big names just you know pleasure hood you go to xoy so in terms of basically trying to make people go to XOY on a Friday and Saturday just because it's a good place to go to as opposed to going there only because Scream's there because fucking Mercy Drum Ensemble's playing, right? They want to turn it into just like a destination. But there's not a lot of places in London that I like that. Most places that I like that are usually the dive bars and the pubs and bars around the place like Blondies and shit and those kind of places where you just go there because you know it's going to be a fucking great time, right? You don't go there because it's going to be a sick lineup. But there's not a lot of places that exist like that. Everywhere just does rely on really good lineups which is the slight concern I have about Fold. Even though I love Fold, a lot of the things that they have rely heavily on big ticket people playing, right? Of course, I think over time, once they get their feet on the table, there might be an occasion where they kind of, you know, chill out and start having Fridays and Saturdays where they just promote loads of people from their local scene. I know they'd have that unfold now on Sunday that kind of helps to do that, but, you know, there's still some way to go for it. Um, but again, not my concern. Um, not my concern. Let's continue. Uh, requests can get out of hand, though. Uh, many years ago, back when people considered the job of DJs being able to mix two tunes together, even free records that might not ordinarily go together, I had a few tricks I'd roll out if the vibes were right. One was to play a very famous pop record over the top of a very cool dance record. No way, you cry. Well, yes, before you stop reading, I should point out that that was some years ago before technology allowed people to mash ups and re edits on their own. In fact, at this time, the only way to do it was live or in a very expensive studio, which no one did because you'd only want to spend that kind of of money on making an original record i should point out that that pop record was not electronic and therefore not easy to keep in that time at all anyway it was popular when i did it people cheered and i felt good it used to do it regularly in my residencies but i'm just to me the probably and probably the entirety of coincidentally another dj decided to actually make that what was then a new concept called a bootleg basically the same pop record as mine with a modern beat underneath it produced it in a very pricey studio suddenly my party piece was everywhere at every disco in town so when a kid came up to me at the booth and asked very politely for about the 30th time that night when i was going to play the bootleg by another dj i'd been playing every week i stopped the record that I was playing and sorry to say i turned to him and screamed it's not a fucking bootleg son it's an original record played simultaneously with another record you might have heard the process it's called dj <laughs> i mean hate myself for it and playing the record again and afterwards i was always practically nice towards people making requests perhaps the problem is a degree of prosperity and lack of respect for each other the people in the crowd thinking the dj is there to be their personal music creator at best uh, yeah that's the one that's horrible a disposable flesh jukebox at worst DJs thinking the people in the crowd are sweaty, massive barbarians who know nothing about anything. Neither of these things are true. Unity was a heart of the brief, the brief beauty that was Acid House, and it can be again if we try. Yeah, that's true. I think um there is that. Again, I think most people, most punters that go to events, go with the idea and the serenity and the respect and the humility to understand that you're going there to see a certain person play. Now, even more so if you're going to a club night and you have no idea who's playing, or you're going to a a, a pub or bar or nightclub you have no idea who's playing there you have no right to request anything because you just gone there and you have no idea so anything that comes to you is a surprise but i think most fans most urge fans that are trying to music are aware of how hard it is to dj the pressure that's around it um already right the last thing you need to add to that person's life is your request leading because immediate good or bad as the request may be it immediately makes you second guess yourself straight away as soon as someone says, hey, could you play this? You suddenly start thinking, what, I've been playing shit for the last 20 minutes, right? And it starts to fuck up your head and all of a sudden you start to make mistakes, you start to play safe. It's not good. Just leave me alone and let me kind of figure out whether or not I'm playing shit by the fact that there's no one here, right? <laughs> or the fact that no one's nodding their feet or no one's tapping their feet. I can tell when I'm doing badly. I know. I've done this long enough, right? I've been playing for fucking eight years, um, I think nearly this year or maybe nine, right? I know, I, I know if I've been doing a good or bad job. Let me do it. And if I'm not doing a good job, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, I'll fix it up for next time. But don't think that you can tell me what to do. It doesn't happen like that. It's just, it's insane. I, I don't know. I, I, again, I just don't understand people that do that. I just never have, never will. But, you know, everyone's got their thing. But <clears throat> me not understand it. Next on the list, 
we have Gucci Mane going nuts. You guys are aware of this story, right? Gucci Mane decided to just go back to the old Gucci Mane. He sat down and interviewed Charlemagne the God and decided to kind of unload on um, Angela Yee from the Breakfast Club because I think they've got some sort of past beef. I'm not sure what it's about, what it transpired from. It seems as if Gucci Mane is accusing um, Angela Yee of banning him from the Breakfast Club because he rejected her sexual advances when Gucci Mane then went out and kind of sit, spoke about this in public. Angela Lee kind of responded in a disparaging way. He then went, he doubled down and started totally disrespecting her in front of Charlemagne. Now, the issue here I have at hand, apart from the people involved in it, because, you know, getting into people's gossip is not fun or not interesting, is just the idea of, because um, I think DJ Envy mentioned in his post responding to Gucci Mane's threats, you know, which he said he's going to slap him up or stepped him when he sees him. He says, DJ Envy is a pussy, all this sort of shit, like crazy shit in it. You know it's better from Gucci Mane now because he's a changed man. You know, he's got his Beijing and his beard. He's all working out and shit. Like, you know, it's better, but, you know, sometimes you you you, you snap, innit? When, you, when somebody crosses a line, you have to kind of defend yourself. But it got me thinking about riding out for your team, right? Because I think DJ Envy mentioned it, right? The term riding for your team. Um, and... And it's more, it has a lot of correlation towards the scene, right? Street scene, music scene, whatever scene you are in. There is, there comes a time when you have to start to accept or understand that the people that you hang out with in the scene aren't your friends. They might be your scene collaborators. They might be your scene collaborators. And what else could they be? Um, they might be your colleagues of this in the scene, in the workplace of the scene. I don't know. Uh, they might be your partners. Um, yeah, whatever. Those kind of things. Co-workers aren't really flat friends, really, are they? Because, you know, especially some workplaces you go to, when it's lunchtime, everyone runs out on their own. When it's home time, people run out on their own. When you're getting ready, suddenly start, people start stopping and not wanting to get ready the same as you, so they don't have to walk out with you in case you, you talk to them on the way home. You know what I mean? Like, you're not really friends. You know what I mean? You just hang out with each other at work, and, and it's only at work. The moment you have, you have the opportunity not to be at work, they, won't be, they don't want to be nowhere near you because they've got their own friends to hang out with, right? There can be some rare occasions where you meet some actually real friends, but for the most part, it doesn't really happen that way. So, you have to, there has come a time we have to realize that, right? They're not really my friends. I, but there's also this confusion when they are right and so when you look at the Charlemagne incident and you look at how disrespectful Gucci Mane was to Charlemagne's friends or co-workers it makes you wonder should you as a friend completely ride with your team and say look I can't even do this interview because you have a problem with one of my friends or co-workers and to you clear it with them then I can proceed or do you just view it as a as a thing of like, they're not really my friends anyway that way and it's not really a real problem. You have to kind of internalize it and justify yourself in your own head. And nowadays, especially in the whole media, social media, um, content game, it seems that people will just do absolutely anything just to make sure they get the clicks and they get the hits. And I think Charlamagne even said the other day when he shares clips on social media, he says, I just do it for the views, isn't it? I don't really care what people think about it. I just put it up there because it gets more views organically, which is fine. But, you know, again, it makes you think whether or not this is something that they cleared beforehand. Did Charlemagne ask you, DJ D Angeli, if it was okay if they could interview each other, if they could interview Gucci Mane? Because I don't know how I'd feel about this sort of thing, right? I don't know how I'd feel about having my friends sit down with somebody that doesn't like me and hear and let them speak about me in this way, right? You would hope that they would say, hey, hey chill out. Like, I, you can't speak like that about my friend in front of me. This is not something I'm cool with. Or just not included in the interview. Just kind of cut the video out in that respect. That would have been cool too, but... Again, in this in this era, cutting bits out of an interview might make you look a bit more nuts and people might start thinking you're conspiring. And There's a weird thing in there, but the, the clip is fucking hilarious in general. But let's just play it in general and hear what he has said. But the the threats he ensues there and the way that DJ MV responded just makes you think like, wow, the boogie, the, 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 the boogie man in, 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 in Gucci Mane still is in there. If you want to bring out the old Gucci Mane is there. If you thought he was a clone, I think this video does a good job of kind of, um, what you call it, denying that in some okay. respects. Yeah, we, people gonna see this and be like, he must be banned, cause why they not in the uh, <laughs> why they not in the studio? But for the record, he's not banned. I don't even know where that came from. It came from that punk ass bitch, man. And DJ Envy, he's a <laughs> pussy too. Envy did it too. Envy's pussy, man. Pussy. He was scared. To, wasn't even scared to come. You know he's scared. What he at? Puss. I didn't know he was supposed to be here. He wasn't gonna come. He wasn't gonna come because the day they did that people squirt thing and you wasn't there, mm -hmm. he was there. Him and uh the girl, whatever. So he ain't had the nuts to come after he did that. I knew it. I wasn't gonna confront him too. I'm gonna say, hey man, you know, you got something to say to me? I just wanna see what he was gonna say. Cause he seemed like he had something he wanted to say to him. 
I don't think it's an issue. So I'm going to give him his, you know, I'm going to give him his face to face. Because Jesus I ain't no Christ. man who had no issue. But I do got an issue with him too. I got an issue with him now. I'm going to step to him. I'm not saying. Just like he stepped to the people were talking about his wife when they came up there. <laughs> yeah. He confronted them. Did his So I'm going to confront him about what him and Angela did. And if he come at me wrong, I'm going to slap the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Well, um, he's definitely laid it out there. But again, I don't know, man. I, 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 I'm always friend first, right? I'm always friendship first. But I think when you're in a scene, when you're part of any kind of industry, it just gets murky, man. You think people you're work because I don't. Again, I don't. Sh- I don't think they're friends. I don't think a lot of people in the industry are friends. I just think it's all kind of just you know you work together. Successful show. They're in. The, they hang out in the morning every single day. Charmaine's been, you know segwaying into his own little lane he's got his youtube channel set up he did the interview with um kanye west he's doing a lot of solo things he's got that whole mental health marketing drive that he's been uh badgering on about you know he's got his thing that he's doing right um but i just don't know how comfortable i'd be if i saw my friend doing this if i saw my friend sitting down with somebody that clearly doesn't like me that i don't like that or that we clearly have an issue with and allowing them to speak about me in this way it's, it's just especially in public that's just it's a bit fuck it's a bit much isn't it? it's a bit much it's a bit much um no amount of warnings can kind of prepare you for this. I think um, Envy mentioned, oh, yeah, he texted me earlier and told me, you know, that this interview was coming out, right? That he, basically, he'd done it already, and then he, then he texted Envy, like, hey, this interview came out. I'm sure Charmaine w- wasn't to know that he, they, they were going to say these, that Gucci Mane was going to say these things. And also, Charmaine can also say, look, I'm not going to step up to fucking Gucci Mane and tell him that, you know, he should never talk about my friends because I don't want to get slapped in the face myself. But there is a kind of honour and morals and dignity that you have to have for yourself and your friends too right i don't think good is going to hit you because you're defending your friend you can say respectfully hey i understand you have got you guys have an issue but i'm that's my friend and you can't be really speaking about my friend like that when i'm around in it because i'm sure if i spoke about your friend like this you wouldn't have it either and he and he as a man you will respect that innit? i think for the most part but i think most people in the scene in the industry will probably do what charlamagne had would do so i think personally i would say if you are in the industry and this in, in this kind of situation does arise and you end up having to be in a room with somebody that your friend, actual friend, doesn't get along with, I think you should do yourself a favor and maybe step out of the situation. I've done it plenty for myself. Or if they start talking wild about your friend, you know, tell them to chill out, right? Or make it known that you don't agree with what they're saying and that your friend is that's their, that's their your friend they're talking about. Because I think the la- that that is something that goes a long way in terms of friendships. Because when you hear that somebody hasn't held you down or hasn't defended your honor when you weren't there. Nothing kind of crushes you more than that. Than learning that the person that you thought was your friend probably isn't right. They're just kind of some timeish. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. I get. I get. He's a scary dude, but bloody hell, man! You can't really let him just go out wild like that against your friend, isn't it? Really. But you know, some people have different motives and stuff. And I guess the, if the views are worth it, then they're worth it. But I couldn't do that, man. I don't think I could live. Not live with myself. But I don't think I could be comfortable sitting down with my friend, have having them know that you know I didn't. I didn't make any effort to kind of you know squash it in any way shape or form but again you know maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm wrong who knows next on the list here we have uh charlotte the wit's amazing interview with uh mix mag i recommend you check it out she's got a whole cover story there that's really cool and that i'm a big fan of um and um yeah I, I, there's not much to really speak about this interview i think in general for the most part i think uh, i mentioned it previously before i think the shoot's really good loads of great styling uh bits and bobs in there i love this header image um on here i'll link it in the show notes for you guys to check out yourselves but it's a basically an image of a shot weight lying on the floor wearing a suit and a pair of air force ones i think women in tailored suits and air force ones especially all white always remind me of phoebe Fowler. always remind me of that kind of epic saline era uh, more women should wear suits with air force ones i think it looks fucking banging she looks great don't get me wrong but i think overall um this it article has a good way of kind of presenting her in a good light it kind of you know harkens back to her time you know under the coast male pseudonym her kind of rise um, it's a really great article but one of the things that kind of made me it kind of made me um think about was just how far things have come and just how amazing it is nowadays imagine you're a girl or imagine you're somebody that's gone to a techno party or gone to an electronic festival electronic music festival and you happen to see someone like this represented on the stage i think it just makes the scene more interesting i look i harken back to that 2016 dj list and look at the names that are on there the same old faces the same old names no real fresh or new change and I think there's new these new groups of girls that are coming up. A blight, they they might have been 
force in your face a bit too much. It's not, I don't think it's their fault. I think it's just more so a convergence, right? As these girls kind of blew up, it also came about the time when social media came at its fucking peak moment or peak times at, at social media, right? Peak popularity of social media where people are exploiting it and using it to the advantage to get more um, traction, to get more exposure. That's where the attention now. So if you're an artist or you've got something to sell, it makes sense to place yourself there. So I think because of that and those convergence, it looks like they've been pushed further. They've been pushed more than ever, but I don't think it's true. I think it's it's uh, Sven Var, if a person like Ben Clock, if a person like Marcel Dietman, if a personality like Seth Troxler came out again this this time around, right, in this era, I think they would have blew up the same the same way, right? I think if you've got a better personality, a better charisma, you've got an interesting look about you and you're able to kind of harness the, uh, social media, you, you're you going to smash it. So I don't, I think it's a bit unfair to say that they've only blown up because social media. I think social media has helped, but it also isn't their fault that they've kind of utilizing it to their advantage. But I think in general, it's going to make the conversation more interesting. And also, I just love the fact that she just seems so genuine. She's like a really nice girl. She's like she's actually loving the whole thing that she's doing. Um, she's living her dream. Um, she did make a really good point about DJ request. So something no about um, guest request. She said that she doesn't mind having pe- ask people asking her for DJ requests. Um, sorry for guest request. She doesn't mind putting them on the list because some of her friends don't turn up. And there's a last bit at the bottom that I really really like. This quote here at the bottom that says, "So I think they kind of ask her whether or not she um, feels bad. What was it? Let me see. There's a quote here at the end I like that she really kind of." hit home to me uh here so this bit here really hit home to me right uh so num- the, the the this 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 paragraph i love more so because you know you go on the djs complaining to a profile or just in general you hear a lot of people complaining about the flights and the travel but in general for me playing out in bars and clubs right i dream about every i dream every day every time i, I finish a set and I sleep at night. I'm always dreaming about, wow, man, imagine if I could do this every for my life. Imagine this could be my job. Imagine this is what I do every single day. Waking up in the morning, spending a couple of hours, going on disc calls, going on beat pool, downloading songs, buying things, going to record stores, uh, flying all around the world on the weekends, coming back, doing the same thing again every single day, making tracks. That would be so good, right? That would be the fucking, the best life, right? Especially nowadays where you can kind of control your career. You can make it similar to, you can you can kind of mirror the stuff that Dixon does and maybe play a hundred dates or maybe less in a year, um, raise a family. Do you know what I mean? Like, so cool. I would fucking love it, right? Like, have fucking your partner be your agent or your booking manager and um, have your friend do your tour schedule for you, um, empower some of your friends that are graphic designers or artists to do all your fucking visual identity tough stuff. I would fucking love it. I would love it. It would be my dream, right? But sometimes you read some of these interviews and you're like, bloody hell, man. It sounds like a torture, isn't it? Being a DJ. But it's good to see these younger guys and girls that are coming up nowadays and are really enjoying the fruits of, you know, cheap travel and fucking Airbnbs and all this sort of shit and Facebook groups and Instagram meme profiles who are really loving life, right? Loving it. And kind of, um, Shari the Wick kind of echoes this in this part of the interview. She says this in the following, right? Um, I really love doing this. She confirms. If I don't, if I didn't completely love it, I wouldn't keep, um, I wouldn't keep up with the lack of sleep and missing friends and family. She'll come home from interest, from an, un, an intercontinental tour and claps on her bed, swearing she'll take time off. But then a day, then after a day, I'll be on my phone to my manager, like, Alexander, what the fuck is going on? What are we doing? And he'll say, Charlotte, you've arrived home yesterday. This is normal. Chill out. So imagine that's how, that's how it makes me smile if you're fucking reading it. That's how excited she's to go out and play music. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing better than a rush of being in a, some, being in a space, bar up pub that i played in mixing something really well and people going whoa right like that kind of scream or seeing people dance it's, it's fucking great man i fucking love it i love it i love it right and there's nothing that's gonna ever no man of successful dj that's complaining about flying all around the world you know 10 times is gonna make me no, not think that so big up to her for saying how good it is right and it continues but she didn't plan to do that anytime soon. I'm addicted to the rush of this life, she says, right? Absolutely addicted. Addicted to standing in front of the crowd that does something very crazy to your mind. Just to be there and see so many thousands of people dancing to your music. I mean, it's crazy. It does something to you. Of course, I understand that. And with all these fans, sellout tours and world tours, it raises the question, does Charlotte still feel that she needs to prove herself? And she says, no. Fuck that. Fuck that. I did it, man. I fucking did it. And if you're still not convinced, then go fuck yourself. Really, for real. Like I've got, I fought for this hard. I'm there. I proved myself and I've worked hard. Fuck yeah. And I love it. I love it. Finally. Um, I think Peggy Goo's always, always been on this kind of track. She kind of, you know, has purposely kind of, you know, put a middle finger up to the haters and kept it moving. But I finally, I'm happy to see loads of these, these DJs that are popping up now who are getting a lot of stick from some of the trolls online. Finally saying, look, even though 
could you have to acknowledge that you you know if you're those kind of girls that have come you have to acknowledge that part of the reason why you have been successful is that convergence right it's of course it's your talent of course it's how long you've been in this industry for but also it's the fact that you know in for lack of a better term they're the they're a novelty, which is a good thing because you want this mix. Like I said, that 2016 top DJ list on RA, it's just the same old faces, right? The only two women on that list on the top 30 are Nina Kravitz and Black Madonna. That's it. And if you're telling me that there's not more than two good women that can DJ out there, you fucking nuts, right? It doesn't make any sort of sense. So um, it's good to see that these girls are being propped up, right? It doesn't matter how you, and I've always maintained, it doesn't matter how you get in, just get in. And once you get in, let your talents keep you there. Don't obviously stay in doing the things that got you in there. But once you get in, make sure your talent keeps you there. And for the most part, no one can say when they go see Peggy Goo, Black Madonna, Nina Kravitz, uh, Amelia Lenz. Amelia Kravitz does it great, but Amelia Lenz, Charlotte, the way and Peggy Goo play. No one can say they can't DJ. They can DJ. It might not be your taste. It might not be your flavor. You might not like their sound, their vibe, or the people they bring to the party. But they can DJ. They know what they're doing. They are professional DJs and other clubs and, and venues have recognized that and are willing to book them. There are some places, I, I know some people like to think as if like DJs only get booked because they're big, but there are some clubs that exist that won't book you if you don't play good music. If you are if, if you play shit or if you don't do well, you won't get rebooked again. It happens quite often. Like, trust me, even on my low level, if I play a shit set somewhere in a bar and people complain or the people at the bar don't like it, I don't get called back again. It's just a fact of life, isn't it? Like, if you don't get a call back from an interview, you have to assume you didn't do a good job, right? So to, to assume that all these DJs are only getting booked because they're popular on social media is insane because we know the popular social media DJs and they're terrible. We know them. We know the people that they play in front of. You know where they play. You've seen them. They're terrible. No one in the industry, no, none of their peers respect them. But I think for the most part, look at those girls, the, all the peers in the industry that you would assume have a bit of dignity and, and hold and have a, a high sense of self-worth and have musical integrity. They approve of them. They, they've stamped them. You know, they're like, no, these girls are legit. So give them a chance. Allow them to grow. Allow them to get better. But also I'm happy that their family, like, you know what, enough's enough. Fuck you guys, man. I've earned my stripes. I've, I've earned my right to be here. And this is it. The, the game is a game. I played it well and I've exploited it. What what are you got to say now? And it, it changes. Soon there'll be another novelty thing that the scene will want and they'll incorporate it. Again, I'm not really sure about the whole splitting the lineup 50-50 thing. I think that's a bit weird. As long as everyone gets in there by merit, I don't care. And also, I want different people playing on the stage. Sorry. I just want different people. I don't want to see the same old lineups. Maybe it's more to do with the club, actually. Clubs may maybe be, be a bit more adventurous and start booking people that aren't the standard people again. But I know it's very difficult in places like London because, you know, you don't have a long time to be open. The, the opening times are quite short. No good licensing law. So you, if you're a bar owner or an event manager or a booker, you have to just make sure people... You have to make sure that the people playing can bring in a crowd that's it you have to make sure they can get they can, they're gonna sell hard tickets uh, it's just the fact of life and unfortunately we probably need more clubs that are like at that lower kind of mid-level that can kind of build a scene and keep people more residencies because that's that's the thing that really worked out well back in the day i don't know why they do it often now residencies are amazing man like having a because i think even that disco night in um the what you got that peckham cafe thing the rooftop I, i'm pretty sure they have residents there playing every every time I'm, i don't even know the name of the dj that play at that party but that that set that disco party the 70s one or whatever that's um it's fucking popular isn't it like it sells out all the time there's always a lot of people that go there you look at the pictures it's a very diverse crowd it does really well i'm not sure people go there because they know the dj that are playing they go there because it's just a good vibe so yeah man i don't know i don't know but yeah um, big up at shout the wit really cool um um cover story for mix mag again so yeah congratulations to her for getting that it's a big look as well for her i'm pretty sure so yeah big up that last sentence was really good so yeah i like it i like it next on the list what do we have here we have what, what is it what the fuck is going on what is this is this a video i don't remember what you don't click stuff on that you put stuff on your list of stuff you want to talk about dallas judge tammy camp is uh, we'll pass on that one um let's go to the let's go to the tabs what do we have here on the first so um bit of street when using this one sneaker wise i don't know about these shoes i don't know why they exist and why it's a thing but again so 40 percent against rights which is the subsidiary brand of double taps have done a collaboration with nike dunk sb and they've got this like jordan six dunk high i don't know why this thing exists i don't know why why it's a thing but it's absolutely hideous i don't think i've seen a what's the best hybrid that exists out is it the sean witherspoon air max 97 thing is that the only model that sort of kind of worked right 
Um, like a 97, 97 at the top and an MX1 sole. Is that the only thing that's worked? Most hybrids are fucking god awful. Why do Nike persist with this hybrid shit? Like, why do they persist with it? What is it? Is that that innovation kitchen stuff? Like, I don't get it. I don't get why it's a thing. Like, every, like, and they always, always end up on the sales rack. You go to Sides, you go to Offspring, you go to Office, you go to fucking Shoe or whatever it may be called. You'll see these shoes. You go to TK Maxx. They're always going to be on the fucking sales rack. And now, I love uh, 40% against rights. I love double taps. I love Tet. But come on, man. The colorway is all me, right? Because, it's, again, it's black and gray. So, you know, you, you, like, you know my body. You know what I do. You know how I get down with black trainers. But bloody hell, like, why do these exist? Like, why is this a thing? And why is it an SB? I just don't know. I have so many questions. So many fucking questions. Um, trust no one on the inside. It's got, like, a. it's got basically the, the, the infrared kind of, you know, so the, the Jordan 6, um, is it 6, right? Jordan 6? Am I right? Yeah, the Jordan 6. It's got Jordan 5 and Jordan 6 detailing in it. That is insane. <laughs> so it's got two Jordans in one. Wow. <laughs> you can't even tell. Okay, so it's got Jordan 6, Jordan 6 tongue. And what, what, what what's the Jordan 5 stuff on it? I don't know. It's got the F-Par on the swoosh instead of Nike. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even look lux, does it? Like, material-wise. It doesn't even look like they, they put the best material. Don't follow me on the fucking thing. I don't know. I don't get why this is a thing. Like, why does this even exist? Let's read the text a bit. Um, even though Hypebeast do a horrible copy, let's just do it anyway. Head of its official release later this month, we now have a closer look at the 40% against rights. Dunk SB, we know that already. This kicked off by the tongue and the fro- and throat, both of which feature detailing borrowed directly from the Jordan 6, namely the cutout top, throat overlay, and lace toggle. Although the design may be familiar, the method of embellishment is decidedly different. Air Jordan branding on the side. The F Jordan 5 inspiration is then made apparent in medallion and lateral swoosh. Ah, okay, so that kind of textured thing is it's from the Jordan 5. Fucking hell, that is shockingly bad. Fresh embellishment, um, unlimited spatial so like Jordan, F Pine found a Tetsu. I well known for the rebellious nihilistic theme. Trust no one's printed there. Don't follow me. It's printed on there. Debossed. Why does this thing exist? Can someone tell me that on the comments if they can? Like, why does this exist? Why is this a thing? Why did why did Ted do? Is this like a is this like a favor he owes Nike or something for for a, a collaboration he didn't deliver on? Like, why is this a thing? This is fucking awful, isn't it? Jesus, it's so shit. It's just like a I don't know. I just don't know why it's a thing. Why is it an SB? Why is there Jordan? I just don't know. I don't know. And again, Nike give up on the hybrids. No one cares, especially this generation. They all want fucking collaborations and crazy colorways and all that malarkey and limited edition shoes. This is not going to be it. Every time I collab, every time they do a hybrid, it ends up on the sh- on the fucking sales rack. Name me a hybrid that hasn't, apart from the shoe rubber spoon, that hasn't set up on the sales rack. Go on, name me one. Name me one. Exactly. You can't. Absolutely shocking. It's so terrible. I mean, I understand. Again, and I love black shoes, right? I'm the fucking king of black trainers. You go to my shoe rack here and you'll see black shoe after black shoe after black shoe. I'm the type of person that will buy the black and red Balenciaga triple S's and still consider whether or not I should buy the triple black Balenciaga tri- triple S's. And if you've seen the Balenciaga triple S's and you've seen the, the black and red one, the bread colorway and the black and black, the the triple black colorway, you will you will think I'm fucking nuts. I'm the person that has fucking 17 camera green jackets, right? Same color, same basically color theme, right? In general same colorway um no no real difference and i don't like this so that's a big that tells you this shit because if i don't like a black shoe it's definitely shit and this is dog awful man yeah cool no more to be said about this man it's terrible but you know what can you do um i don't know why it exists don't know why it's a thing but you know i think everyone has their taste and whatever and i'm interested to see if it sells out or not i doubt it because kids nowadays don't really care about that sort of stuff but i could be wrong um let's move on to the other stuff we've got in here uh, supposedly on hype there's news here that the pizza hut are going to put a uh, plant-based sausage pizza in a round box i don't know why it's a thing um let's read it uh, pizza hut um marks the latest restaurant chain to experiment with plant-based meat alternatives with an introduction of a garden speciality pizza that features morning star farms incog- incognito italian sausage along with onions mushrooms and banana peppers uh this particular sustainable efforts even further pizza hut is also testing out new round boxes that will eliminate significant amount of packaging material per box wow imagine what that's the good thing about this um rise of you know health and um, environmental awareness and shit like imagine a corporation like pizza deciding to make a plant-based burger a plant-based pizza that's quite nuts number one 
Number two, the fact that they're trying to eliminate waste by making a round pizza box is quite innovative. I like the look of it. It's quite interesting as a design, right? Uh, bit and pieces but imagine being a plant-based enthusiast or having a subscribing to a plant-based diet and deciding right cognitively like you know with a sound mind sober right not high not drunk and deciding today for dinner i'm gonna order a pizza from pizza hut like you have to be insane right this is like the vegans that are overweight and only eat chips and cheese you have to be nuts to subscribe to that kind of lifestyle and think that it's it's morally right for you to give your money to a, a, an organization like Pizza Hut. No mention of who they're owned by or anything, but if you do the research, you'll know what I'm talking about. You have to be fucking nuts in your head. And if you get called out on it, you can't be angry. You should know you should be getting called out. If you're, uh, if you're, if you're a vegan, if you subscribe to a plant-based diet and you're buying a Pizza Hut from Pizza, you, a, a pizza from Pizza Hut, you are, you are nuts. There's something wrong with you. Really wrong with you. You should be supporting your local um plant-based restaurant um or cafe spot or whatever it may be called you should that's where you should be going to put your money not to fucking pizza hut again kudos to them for trying and trying to get that you know that um plant-based dollar out there but i don't know man i don't know imagine if you follow someone a a, a person on social media that is quite you know well known in the the plant-based industry and they start reviewing this stuff you might have to look at them a bit different and they even change their fucking sign on pizza hut the little hut thing to green it's like oh cringe man whenever a company markets directly to a specific group of people interested it always ends up like this isn't it it's always fucking done really heavy-handedly isn't it so cringe it really is so cringe it really is so cringe it's like when you know brands started directly marketing to sneakerhead that's when fucking sneakerhead culture basically died didn't it effectively right because they essentially instead of going back to the essence of it they just said oh yeah these guys like crazy colorways um mad x's in between the brands that we're collaborating with so x x collaborate collaboration and they're like limited numbers cool let's do it this is what they did just pressed it they didn't even think about who the brands were where they were launching it activations it's just all about yeah colors numbers names cool let's do it let's sell it and then that's that's basically when sneaker culture died really isn't it now you just got this hype beast reselling culture that's infested everywhere where kids are not really even you know buying sneakers in that way anymore which is a different way of buying it which i'm not against don't do your thing but this is insane you have to be nuts to buy a plant-based pizza from pizza hut honestly you really have to be nuts i don't i don't i, I just don't know how you could justify that to yourself really um to have that strong because usually when you're when you subscribe to a plant-based diet you have quite a strong view on how society should be shaped you have quite strong political views right um you probably um, are very uh, particular about the brands you associate yourself with, the brands that you buy into or who you support, right? You're very, you're very particular with those kind of things. So to kind of sit there and say, "Yeah, I'm gonna take that Pizza Hut money," you have to really have to take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror, man. But I'm sure there's probably a lot of influence out there that have already taken that Pizza Hut dollar. I'm just probably talking out my ass, but I don't know because I'm not a plant-based enthusiast. Um, next on the list here, what else do we have? Let's get into this. Um, oh, Stussy. Stussy 2019. I mentioned previously before, Stussy are one of my favorite brands out at the moment. They're doing some fucking great work. Um, Stussy 4 2019 collection lookbook has been launched just now. Uh, photographed by Mark Lebon, I'm, I'm assuming. Standard um, standard jobby there. Mark or Tyrone, one of the Lebons. One of those guys that does amazing analog fucking pictures. They always great, do great pictures. I'm not sure they're analog or digital, but wherever they are, they're always fucking amazing. Um, yeah, great lookbook as per usual. Again, I'm not sure why Stussy doesn't get more hype more a more kind of traction on social media but their collections so far since the kind of rebrand and the reintroduction back into the you know into into the current conversation i'm not sure what who i'm not sure who's responsible for it or who's driving that drive in the creative team or whatever they're doing there but congratulations on everything you've done bro because it's always fucking sick the lookbook looks amazing um they've got this i got up on here on the screen from high snobiety i'll link in the show notes for you guys to see for yourselves but the lookbook looks fucking sick got one image here at the top you got a sort of like is that a tie-dye pinstripe shirt right really nice done probably look nice heavy fabric a nice knitted um hat and a beanie hat there with the stussy uh script or logo written on it on the front which is in black and white which is kind of you know it's going to be an instant hit that one nice sunglasses you've got the oh you've got that great s on the jumpers too that looks fucking amazing you got this nice green fleece. They're doing good fleeces. That scarf looks fucking great. It looks like all the it looks like all the little pieces of material you pick up when you go to Bali or something, right? It looks fucking cool there. Oh yeah, it's Mark Lebon that took the pictures. Um, you've got a nice uh, little Parisian hat um, as well. It looks really cool. A nice jumper that reminds you of stuff from the eighties or seventies. A nice boxy shape on the jumper as well. 
just fucking immensely nice. Like that shirt is fucking banging. It's like a is that a shirt or jacket. I don't know. It's like a a mechanic shirt, right? With the Stushi logo, pinstripe. You got yellow plaid trousers. You got studded belts. Woohoo! I'm all over that belt, man. That belt looks fucking sick. I wonder if that's a jacket or if that's a a, a long sleeve shirt under the jacket. But the styling on this lookbook is fucking banging. It's so good. You got another plaid shirt here, plaid or plaid fleece in yellow and black. Looks really nice. Yeah, an orange hood. And yeah, just in general, just a really fucking good collection. Um, you got another bit of lookbook here down below. I'm going to quickly scan through plaid shirt, nice half zips. Oh, they got some nice combat trousers there. It looks like with pouches inside, a bucket hat. That I'd love. I would. I would love to wear bucket hats again, man. But my head is so fucking large. It's insane how large my head is. Um, and this hair doesn't help either. But yeah, bucket hat looks fucking amazing. Nice little warm up jacket. A nice kind of patchwork shirt. It looks similar to something that Noel would do or put together. That looks really nice. I like the look of that one as well. What else do you have here? Oh, love that t-shirt. That kind of t-shirt. That kind of color on a black dude always looks nice anyway, but those trousers look nice. Nice loafers. Maybe it's a collaboration as well. A loafer collaboration. Oh, those 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 pants are great. I like this pants. And remember I said about loafers and pants? I love it when Stussy does it. Any other brand does it, go fuck yourself. Stussy, I support you. <laughs> um, hypocrite? Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, let's go. Contradiction? Yeah. Uh, but what can you do? Um, they've got a nice little tactical vest here or fishing vest. I'm not sure what you'd call it. Very nice. Um, a nice little shadow plaid shirt, we'd call it. Some nice uh, pleated trousers. Yeah, some good shorts for the winter times when you're feeling frisky. Lep what is that? Camera print trousers with some nice little um, Stussy embellishment. And is that a uh, corduroy jumper? Or a velvet jumper. I don't know what that is, but it looks very nice. But in general, really cool. Is there any coincidence that both dudes have mustaches? I'm not sure if that's a thing coming back in in vogue at the moment. Everyone's got a tash on at the moment. I'm not really game for it because, you know, just don't like tashes. I think it makes you look like a rapist. Or I look like a, um, um, what they call them on the internet, a nonce, right? <laughs> I don't think that's a great way to go about things. But, you know, what can you do? I'm not calling these guys nonces, by the way, for your information. I'm just saying, myself. I don't think I look too good of a tash on. But yeah, big up Stussy. I'm um, doing the God's work. Stussy Holiday Collection is going to, is dropping on the 25th. So that is sometime very soon. So check that out if you are that way inclined. Stussy Forward in the collection will be available at all your favorite Stussy outlets. I think they've got, they got their own store, right? You can purchase from as well. But if you are if you live in London, you can also check out their store in London too. But yeah, good work from Stussy. I'm a fan of that collection. One of my favorites, actually. I, I think Stussy do really good work. People are, people really underest people don't talk about Stussy enough. For what they kind of went through, that whole kind of, you know, when Sean, when Sean Stussy left and they went through this weird period of, you know, it was a bit shit, it got a bit stagnant. For them to come back and rise from the embers, especially when you see some of the stuff that Vapor are doing nowadays, Oof, so garbage, right? Babe sponsoring some F1 thing I saw the other day. Like, just that Puma jacket that AJ Tracy was wearing. I still can't get over how shit that was. Um, so many misses. So for Stussy to be still smashing it now, congratulations and kudos to everyone involved on that team, mate. Doing a good job. If if you if you wanted my approval, you got it. Uh, next on the list, what do we have here? Would the body ba 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 ba? We have oh, we have um uh, powers four nineteen collection. I only mention this because Eric Elms is a legend. I worked with him previously at the previous company I worked for. Um, he is responsible for some of the coolest graphics that you would know from back in the day of Supreme and a New York thing. Big up Aaron Bondaro, wherever you may be. Hold your head up high, dog. Um, yeah, Eric Elms has got this brand called Power Supply that's uh, Power, Power Supply that's doing really well. A really small capsule collection, really small kind of streetwear collection that he kind of puts out um, season after season. But again, I just love it because it to me represents what I fell in love about, what I fell in love with streetwear back in the day, right? These kind of really um, gritty and not gritty, but these kind of really, you know, stark contrast analog film pictures, um, really basic items, hats, beanies, t-shirts, hoodies, a lot of keychains. You know what I mean? Like just the quintessential streetwear items. You know those kind of line sheets you'd get with the hats and the jumpers and the long sleeve. What I see streetwear as, like the kind of quintessential video of it, can't so much stuff can go there further down the line, but just the staples, the kush jacket, that's what I love. That essence of it. And of course, he took this lookbook to Tokyo, it looks like, in Japan for the four women lookbook. Here's it is on, on Hypebeast. I'll link it again in the show notes if you guys check out yourself. Um, on the first shot, we have a nice t shirt, we have a beanie, we have a uh, a, a hat in kind of a burgundy colorway with powers written in the front of it a nice kind of college font which is going to be very good i like that kind of look we've got the same in a jumper we've got a native uh long sleeve we've got is that is that shirt there underneath there part of it hell on earth that might be part of the collection as well maybe not we've got a nice little jumper again 
just a very cool and tasteful lookbook but in a really cool way we've got the infamous uh, logo that he put together that's also featured in a book that i have somewhere around there. i have an eric owens book somewhere around there but i can't get it out now but yeah in a jumper as well you got the power powers um snapback hat again which i think is gonna be very popular um that's that's shin isn't it yeah um we should do stuff with ada she's there as well uh power hoodie again in a t-shirt and in a hoodie you also have these cool glasses that look great you have that great logo and that kind of um what's your camp cat which looks amazing and it's really really tastefully done um streetwear this is what i imagined you know og streetwear to be like and i i really like the the logo he has with the with the screw i think that's really cool i think if i was in another industry or if i lived if i had another life i think i'd get that um as a tattoo somewhere on my arm that screw powers maybe written something else on it um maybe persistent or something i think i don't know there's something i do with that screw i think i look really cool as a tattoo actually it's like a tattoo um in a a, ve a vector illustration of a tattoo essentially if you're just doing a podcast but yeah really great tastefully done again like i mentioned loads of long sleeve shirts here on the instagram post a couple of hoodies some sweatpants hats and a couple of accessories just really standard streetwear what i why i kind of fell in love with back in the day amazing stuff loads of nice t-shirts loads of nice tops and sweats and pants and stuff and again coming from an actual og from the scene i recommend you guys real try and support this and and kind of you know give him all your love and all your support throw your money at his online store and buy as much as you can um yeah i'm a big fan of eric comes what he does um it's going to be online it's online now available now for you to purchase so yeah check that out if you're that way inclined if you're a fan of all the og streetwear stuff from back in the day and you're a fan of what they used to do back in the day from supreme and, and new york thing then eric Holmes is your guy so I definitely recommend you check it out um, it's available now at what's his website uh powers dot supply available now ww dot powers or supply uh for in a collection from powers really nice lookbook altogether i like it it's amazing it's great check it out don't waste your time cool anyway that's one hour thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have you have your ears as always, if you want to check out more regarding myself, go to my website, actionzinger.com. You see my DJ gigs, all my DJ mixes, contact sheets, all that sort of stuff. Blog entry. You can check out my blog. We're going to have updated in a while, but check it out anyway. It's cool to get that traction on there. If you want to support the show and you want to make sure that I get new cameras and microphones or you're trying to buy me a beer because you're a nice guy and you want me to have a nice time, um, then support me on the Patreon. Link below in the show descriptions. Um, if you listen via podcast app, of course, five star review, five star review will go a long way to hear people see the show, you know, spread it all that malarkey, nice algorithm bump. If you're watching via YouTube, give me a little thumbs up, maybe leave a comment if you have a question. But apart from that, no more requests. I, I bid you farewell, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Peace and take care, my friends. Bye. <laughs>